Thanks everybody for coming to join us today to learn a little bit about React. So I'm TJ Van Toll. I've got Sam Basu with me. And Sam, do you want to explain a little bit more about uh, what we're doing today? Yes, absolutely. But uh, before we start, though, let's uh, let's check in with anybody who may be on the live stream to make sure our audio and video are coming through right. Yeah, if anybody could drop into the chat and just give us like a quick thumbs up, everything's looking good. So we got our. Let me pull this up as well. Title today. Yeah, I'm looking as well. Yeah, I just popped into the stream for a minute, and I think I think we're good to go. Yep. Okay. And uh, how about my audio? I think we sound good. I'm hearing both of us, so we yep. should be good okay. to go. I, I hear us as well. All right. So TJ, do you want to introduce us? Yeah. So I'm TJ Van Toll, developer advocate at Progress. I've got Sam Basu online, and it's developer advocate here at Progress as well. And what we're doing is we're trying something, I guess, a little bit different here on the stream. And we're going to be taking a number of topics and almost turning these into like little teaching sessions. So we've, we've got uh, today we're going to be talking about React. I think next week we're doing some Xamarin stuff, Sam, where basically one of us goes in that, in, at least in theory, is knowledgeable about a topic. And then somebody else can come in and just ask questions. If you're in the chat, you can get involved as well. And so today we'll be tackling React. Oh, exactly. All right. Can you still see me, TJ? I can. You've gotten into costume. <laughs> All right. Hey, folks, this is Viking Sam. And I'm here today with this bloke named Theodore. And he thinks he's got a thing or thing thing or two to teach me can you believe it yeah anyways just when all of us knew for sure that the web was dead right it was all apps man that's all you make this guy wants to keep on building web apps huh and then he's got this new thing called react and i'm supposed to react to that anyways i'm giving this guy one hour one hour to impress me and if he doesn't all right bye you go. All right. The, I've got some pressure now. So, mm -hmm. so Viking Sam, what do you tell me just off the bat? Like, what do you know? Like, what's your short pitch? Like, what do you know about React coming into this? Okay. So it is um, a JavaScript spa framework. So you build single page applications where you uh, load up most of what you need. And um, hopefully you don't have to spend a lot of energy building in the service worker, the offline bits, but essentially just um, the JSX to pull in your um, data and then bind it to the UI. And then how do you start? What are the tools to even begin? What IDs can you use? Where can I go start building a React app today? Yeah, so you have a couple different choices. And so the answer, the, like the short answer is you can build React just about anywhere you can use any text editor any ide you can also start online so there are hell of world templates on uh, really if you've used any of these sort of online builder tools uh, i happen to be a pretty big fan of stack blitz so if you go to stack blitz and actually let me just go to like the just in case you totally follow so if you just go to like say the stack blitz home page and you scroll down You'll see you can start a new workspace. You can pick React. And you'll be given like the world's simplest Hello World app. And this might be the easiest place to get started for um, really if you're just trying out some like simple um, Hello World type of stuff just because you've instantly got an environment up. You don't have to worry about having Node or NPM or anything like that. And then as soon as you change something, you can instantly see it happen in here. And these environments also take care of, like, under the hood, there's some Webpack craziness going on, um, some things to handle, the JSX. But you really don't need to worry about any of that. Uh, really, in this case, you're just dealing with just a small handful of files. 
Okay, so several questions right out of the bat. Uh, when you do an import here, what exactly are you importing and how are they hooking this up? Yeah, so there's a bit of, some of this is stuff that's now built into JavaScript and some of it is uh, basically React specific stuff. So this stuff here is actually um, now just a part of JavaScript native. So a lot of what you'll see with React is using modern, I, I, should, I say modern, but like more uh, like really cutting edge JavaScript features. And they're leveraging tools like Babel to make sure that those features continue to work in older browsers. And so imports is one of those things. So this is actually like spec compliant code here. And for example, like this is probably the easiest one to look at. So we're importing a uh, hello from this file for so dot slash a local file. And then in this file, it's exporting uh, in this case. So this is again, some crazy JavaScript here. Uh, this is actually exporting a function. So this is the arrow function Ooh. like this. Okay, uh, questions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, but uh, in the chat room, little one on one says hello. So hello, hello, and hello, we're actually one -on -one. writing hello while you while you say that. Yeah. So um, you said a couple of things that I have questions about. Uh, can you go back and explain what Babel was back in the days, and uh, if we are still using it, and what does it mean to export a function, essentially? Yeah. So. Babel is a tool, it's been around for a while, that basically tries to solve the problem of you have newer JavaScript features that you want to use, but you're worried about uh, browser support or maybe even just support for older JavaScript environments. Like maybe you even need your code to run in like an older version of Node or um, it's usually old browsers though. And in this case, what React is trying to do is using really cutting edge stuff, stuff that uh, in some cases isn't even implemented in like the latest Chrome, for example. Like I can't remember, maybe somebody in chat knows, but uh, the import function is especially new because JavaScript modules have been in a pretty hotly debated topic. So I'm not even sure whether this syntax works like in the, the absolute latest and greatest Chrome builds, but React is using Babel to essentially transpile your code here. So even though you see just an index.js file, what actually gets rendered here, and we can sort of dive into this, this index.js file isn't going to be run uh, directly in the browser. And if we dive in here, you'll see somewhere in here, and I'll, I can make this bigger in a second, um, you'll see that like there's some Webpack nonsense going on under the hood uh let's see it's probably going to be uh, something like this i don't even know um, that's actually taking this code and it's going to mangle it to do things like make sure all of these things use some version of a javascript feature that's going to work in all browsers today um, the same is going to be true for things like the arrow function so this is getting at your um your second question this is um th this code is at least conceptually like a lot of other programming languages out there. Um, I know Java does this, so and I'm, I presume C Sharp has something similar, Sam. And maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially you you import uh, from files, and then in these other files you export. Essentially, um, you can export really anything. Like you could export a collection of functions, you could export a class, you could export constants. And in this case, it's exporting a single function. And because it's using this default keyword, that's going to um, let it uh, be imported with essentially the, the same name as the file, as I'm pretty sure how that works. To be honest, I'm not okay. totally um, familiar with the exact syntax of this, just because this is pretty new stuff. Mm -hmm. So when when you do an import, like I, I see the dependencies, like that React needs to bootstrap itself, but is that is that the same syntax you would use to bring in your app's own dependencies? Yeah. So in this case, like this is um, an app specific dependency, so this isn't right. part of React. And there's different ways of you can you can do this. So um, like this syntax style, if I'm remembering correctly, is for the default. And then this is how you can 
Um, like if you're exporting multiple things, so React DOM would be exporting a whole bunch of stuff. And you could pull out just the render function just to give you a shorthand. Because you can also do things like this mm -hmm. should work as well. Like um, I could say something import star as React DOM from here. But then down here, I'd have to say, um, or actually, it's this render. So I'd have to say React DOM dot render, and that would continue to work. So the the idea behind this syntax is just um, essentially this is called a destructure in JavaScript. Essentially, I'm just getting a shorthand for this, and really all it is is a syntax shorthand to keep my code a little bit cleaner. Gotcha. And um, when you say export, um, you, you're not meaning export as in there is maybe a business logic uh, in your app that you want somebody else to reuse. That's not what you mean, right? You essentially mean the app being exposed out to the browser uh, JavaScript engine. So it actually is like you could absolutely use this for business logic. So let's say, uh, let's pretend this is... Um, I don't know. Let's make this our new great Nate. I always like to call things business. So this is Acme business and they do important business things. And this is like, um, let's say this is some important value that like needs, you need to do some really important calculation that uh, takes in some inputs, does some calculation and does this here. So what you could do is say in here, so we'd ex export default and let's say we need to return. We'll just make this a pass through for the moment. Uh, what doesn't it like here? None of the assertions can omit. Uh, I typed something wrong. Oh, because I have, <laughs> duh. So this is a, a function. It's it's an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name. So I'll explain the syntax in a second. But first, I just want to show what this looks like. And what I could do is say, so I'm getting like, um, hello, in this case, is a component. And, and does a component always return HTML DOM? So in yes. Uh, and actually, so we're we're opening a couple different cans of worms here. <laughs> uh, but in this case, this is actually uh, JSX. So let me just get rid of the like JSX bit of this. Let's just pretend this is this is like straight JavaScript and not really. Um, so let's say this is like business logic JS, and let's say we need to get probably even give this thing a name like compute. Well, we'll just keep it a default function. And let's say we're doing, we're getting business logic. And then down here, we would say compute. And so this really isn't um, React at all. This is, well, mm -hmm. some of this is, but just specifically, because we'll get into the other stuff in a minute, just focusing on the import export stuff. So this could be for business logic stuff, right? Like the code in here could be some algorithm or whatever, and you want to make this reusable. So you export that function out of here and then use it in here. And really this is just like syntax niceties for something that used to be kind of hard to do in JavaScript. Like if you've ever, I don't know, Sam, if you use like um, or heard of like AMD in JavaScript or Require JS or mm -hmm. um, Common JS, like there's there's been a number of attempts to do make this easier in JavaScript because historically this has been kind of hard, and this is sort of the spec, the JavaScript specifications way of trying to make this as easy as possible. Gotcha. And uh, if if you were to use that compute function from another app, like what part of this needs to be available to the browser or and how would you use it? Um, yeah, so I mean, you could import this really anywhere um, in this case. 
And really, since there's no browser dependency, well, I guess React is kind of a browser dependency, but uh, really you could even use this in like a, a, a Node app, for example, and still leverage this code. Does that help? Did I, I don't know if I totally understood yeah, your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no, that, that's what I'm getting to. So like, uh, I, I guess the other aspect of this is if you had some business logic, let's just say you're working in an enterprise and your component essentially just returns some computed value that's important uh, for the workflow that you are building with the rest of your team. And for me to take um, or consume your component, does your app needs to be published out to like NPM or could I kind of somehow import it without you having to publish it out? Um, I mean, you, the easiest way to share it would be through NPM. And yeah. like NPM has things like private registries. So if you had like logic you wanted to share within your company, but not put it on like the public NPM registry, there's ways of doing that. I mean, you can always like old school, like copy and paste or like throw it out on some, you know, there's, there's very hacky ways, but NPM is sort of the, the sort of canonical way of doing that. And that's sort of how like React and React DOM work because these are things that are on NPM, they expose APIs and then you can import them. So usually NPM, um, and like, like I said, you can even do um, private NPM repositories or even just you can create your own NPM sort of module and just sort of like host it internally at your company because like in your package.json, I mean, you could point to pretty much anything here. Like by default, it's going to look at the NPM registry, but mm -hmm. I could just say, I mean, I could, you, you can do like this sort of thing too, or you even do like this and maybe you point it like a network thing, or maybe you have a build script that does something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so there's, there's ways of, of doing that um, sort of thing okay. as well. Yeah. Sorry for asking like inane questions. No, no, and the... That's the whole idea. And if, I mean, if Chad, if you're following along this too, uh, no question is, is too basic too. This is supposed to be like React, JavaScript, um, beginner stuff. So feel free to chime in as well. Yeah. All right. And then one more question on, on, on your index.js. Um, so I see the big render method uh, in which you're rendering your, your DOM. Um, there is no way you can have two, could you? Or like choose between what your component wants to render given certain circumstances? No, what you would probably do is put some sort of conditional. Um, like, because yeah. I mean, you could create two functions like render one and then like render two and then like you know in here say like well you can even just say you know if whatever you do something like this yeah uh, but there's no way of like conditionally doing that right and then um, the uh, the lowest um, line of code that you have, which renders the app. So by an app, you mean like this particular module that you're building, right? Or is there other ways of rendering this? Um, yeah. So in, usually this is like the, um, at some point you need to, for the most part in React, you don't even necessarily need to know that the DOM exists. Uh, so it's very much a different way of approaching app development uh, against like, say, jQuery, for example. But usually you at least need to tell React or um, tell React how to render sort of the, the, the starting point, the root of your app. So in StackBlitz, the way they do this is they say, take this app and then render it in the root. And like the index HTML is just a single div. And so in this case, you're telling React to do that. Theoretically, you can do things like render, like build a React app that only takes up part of your app. So like you could have, you could get into craziness where like only a portion of your screen of your application is controlled by React. But I think in practice, no one actually does that. At least I haven't run into anybody doing it. I, almost everybody just says, just have some base level app components and essentially let that take over everything. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Hey, uh, let's take a quick uh, pause because uh, I see uh, some new folks. Uh, so Sanic uh, on the chat room was asking if this is a client dev talk. Um, sort of. Uh, so just again for perspective, this is Coded Live. Um, TJ uh, and me are both developer advocates, and, and um, I have a lot of .NET uh, background, and I know uh, just a little bit of JavaScript to be dangerous. So TJ is essentially teaching me React uh, today, just kind of how to get started, what are some of the pieces we're dealing with. So this is kind of essentially um, uh, React 101. I also see um, Ivana Dim in the chat room say, hey, so hello. Hey. And if anybody following along, you know, any the, the idea here is one of the things we're experimenting with on Code It Live is doing some of these sessions on uh, sort of like 101, 102 level content. And so today we're doing React. I think next week we're doing Xamarin. We're going to throw around some other topics as well. So if you find this interesting, you know, let us know. Or if you have some ideas for other topics, uh, we're definitely listening. Yep. OK, so you get the bare bones React app this way. Um, now, this is all in browser. And um, Stackbiz is essentially hosting all of your dependencies at this point, or is, is Webpack doing some of it? Yeah, so Stackblitz is doing all of the, the hosting. I could you know, download this code and start working locally uh, as well, because really all Stackblitz is doing is just giving me a, a UI that handles something that I'd otherwise have to set up locally. So I can either um, do you want to where do you want to take this Sam and or chat? Do you want to like keep diving into React features? Do you want me to show like how you do this uh, with a local setup? I guess what are you most interested in in taking this? Um, so for me, I, I want to know like other ways in which I can get started because uh, Stackbit seems like one way. Uh, what are some of the tools? Like how would you start with the CLI, and um, what IDs do you use? Yeah, so the sort of canonical way that most people start with React nowadays is create React app. And and that's what uh, in the chat room, DJ Concorn, that's what he says. Yeah, so. Uh, or she, sorry. Yeah, so see, like they've, they've got a section on recommended tool chains. And if you're learning React or creating a new one, create React is generally the way to go. That's what most people nowadays use. And the idea is uh, basically you do this. So I'll go ahead and run this locally. And give me a second to find my terminal. There it is. Uh, I'm not seeing that yet. Oh. Yeah, there you go. You yeah, got it. I see it. And we'll call this um, uh, code it live. Why not? And this MPX command, Sam, I don't know if you've seen this before, but no, please explain. this is a way of running an NPM package without having to globally install it. So if, if you've ever like, uh, I don't know how many times I run into this a lot where you're, you're working with some JavaScript tool. And the first thing they tell you to do is like npm install dash g whatever, like angular dash yep. cli, yep. you know, you name it. And the problem with that workflow is that you install this and then like six months, a year goes by whatever, and you never update this thing. Mm -hmm. And you forget about it. And then you're, you're starting apps with like an old version of it. So what MPX does is say, just go ahead and get the latest version of this without having to install it locally and then run it. So in this case, it's saying for like a one time deal, get the latest version of this thing, and then use it to build a new app code it live. And so the idea is that when you run this, you're always going to be getting the latest version, which is probably what you want if you're installing, you're starting up a new app in this case. So you typically want the latest version of everything for something brand new. Okay, so the one downside that I might see is like, I can't do this if I'm offline. Um, so you can still install this globally. So in that case, you wouldn't use MPX. You would just NPM install the thing, and then it would be available locally. You just you can't update, obviously, if you're offline, but yeah. if you, can, you can install it and get it ready to go. And I know, like, I imagine I'm not positive of this. Maybe somebody in chat knows, but um, I'm pretty sure, like, tools like Visual Studio probably have some of this like built in to like the file new experience as well. 
that just uses this under the hood, but I don't totally know. Okay, so just to take a quick pause, uh, I see Joseph Gudagno in the chat room. Hey, Joe, he's our good friend. Um, he said, Yarn allows you to cache packages. Uh, and I see some Yarn stuff in what you did. Is that kind of built in? Yeah, so Yarn is, is basically like, <laughs> this, this is like more of the confusing JavaScript world. Yarn is like, I almost think of it like a superset of NPM. It's basically something Facebook developed to try to optimize NPM. And so as uh, he's mentioning in the, the chat, it'll do things like cache packages for you. So NPM installs and such go a little bit faster. So if you've ever been annoyed uh, by that, but it stays, it, it tries to stay compatible with NPM. So I, that's why I think of it as a, like a superset because NPM is so uh, sort of built into the, the way everything in JavaScript works nowadays, you sort of have to, to work with that. So when you use Yarn, you still have things like a package.json file. Um, you would still install things from NPM, but you get things like um, cached packages. Uh, I know there's some other, uh, maybe some people in chat know some of the other performance optimizations that Yarn does. Uh, but I even find it somewhat confusing because uh, even like Facebook's own documentation, I found at times is is incompatible. So they'll say things like, you know, the commands in here talk about NPM start. And then later on, they, they switch to, to Yarn later on. So it's like they, they can't even make their mind as to what exactly they should be using. Like, see, they, they don't pick a side. They just mm -hmm. give you both, which I sort of get it. But at the same time, it'd be nice if they were just consistent and just told you this is the way we think you should do it. And um, this is yeah. how you should go forward. So, so this kind of uh, ties into, sorry, I got uh shouting kid in the background. Yeah, it's the new <laughs> reality of what we are all living through. Uh, so uh, DJ Concarn in the chat room was asking if uh, if uh, when you do uh, the NPX thing, does it do the NPM start by default? Uh, or that's kind of you, how you bootstrap your app, right? Yeah, so it does not. And it also, I don't believe it does the, like the NPM install either. And so what I did just to, um, basically I took this app, so it finished building here in my terminal. And usually I like nowadays I'm I'm a pretty big fan of Visual Studio Code. So I open this up in code. And code has also has pretty good just integrated terminal support. So I just opened up a so I've got the the Coded Live app. This is the app I just built with Create React app. And I opened up a terminal that's right in place. And now I'm installing all of these dependencies. And the thing, the one reason I think Stack Blitz is really nice for getting started is you can see that even though React is pretty good about uh, appearing pretty simple, like the file structure really here isn't that bad, Be Create React app, these scripts are doing a whole lot under the hood. Like if I open up my node modules, like, you know, here's, I think Ed's here. Ed's going to love this meme. Just <laughs> me scrolling down and seeing like the ungodly oh, number of things that are in node modules under the hood. So just for reference, uh, Ed Trevor is our colleague and our good friend. He's in the chat room. He is all about Blazor, and he has had a love-hate relationship with JavaScript. So the Node Modules folder, that's like half the internet dumped on your hard drive, right? Yeah. No, the, like So actually, the one concerning thing I have with... So Create React App, what's great is it really does make things simple. But the the downside to me is this section here about what you get with create React app. So it's letting you do things like, you know, your JavaScript, you can use TypeScript, uh, you get all these scripts, you get a development server, which is cool. The downside is, is it's pretty heavy handed because of that. And you can see just by like the sheer length of we've been watching NPM install still going. here, it's still going. Whereas in stack blitz, we were able to get started in I mean, what, like mere seconds, essentially? So Yeah, so let me read a few things that are coming in the chat room. Uh, so Joe agrees that node modules is quite a thing. Yeah, so he's actually drawing references from the .NET world and NuGet, and I want to ask about that. Um, um, so npx package run the start script of the package. Um, I think the answer to that is no, but I, I am actually not positive. I think... So um, I'm not totally sure. I'm not totally sure about that, actually. 
Okay, so let, let's uh, let's recap. So if you're a .NET developer uh, like myself, and if you started a new project, and if you had uh, dependencies, then you would go to NuGet uh, as your source, because that's think of that as like our NPM where things are published, and then you will bring in the dependencies. And, and just like what you have, you can uh, have a lot of dependencies that are all M in the same project, right? So, I mean, if you go into your file explorer right now, that node modules, that's in oh, yeah. that uh, project, right? Yep. So we, we have that as well in .NET, but I think, um, and I, I don't know if NPM or node modules can be shared because we have the concept of a global assembly cache where you can start sharing some assemblies that you want to reuse between apps. Yeah, um, and actually I'm wondering if I shouldn't have used uh, I, I'd be curious. I'm not going to do this here just because it'll take too much time at this point. But I'm wondering if Yarn is better about this exact step of caching some of these things because you know, I've ran Create React app before. There's no reason it should be downloading all of this nonsense from the internet. Uh, but yeah, so see, like this is absolutely absurd, right? 464 packages updated mm -hmm. 1361. Like it, that's just absolute uh, nonsense just to get this up and running. Yeah, and, and Joe in the chat room is saying that's kind of what uh, Yarn does. Yeah. yeah. So I had one more question. So you started with Stack Blitz and you showed off um, Webpack integration that was kind of built in what they were throwing up. Is that correct? Yes. But then uh, when you do it through Create React App, I see Yarn. Now, like, the, does Yarn do the similar of uh, similar like packaging and uh, exposing of modules that Webpack does? So Yarn is specifically about the NPM type of stuff. Uh, so it's, it's a totally separate tool from Webpack. And Create React App actually does something similar to, let me get a little more screen real estate here. Uh, Create React App is going to do something similar where Webpack is happening here. But one of the features of Create React App is it essentially hides that from you, from needing to know this. So you can run React. And actually, for like if you were doing basically about to start a new React App, uh, sort of that you intended to be a really big app for your company, like something super important, I'd probably look into sort of the manual way of getting started with React, where Essentially, you start with your own Webpack configuration file and keep things a lot simpler so you can avoid some of the heavy handedness that comes with Create React App. Because, the, for example, under the hood here, there's Webpack is running, Babel is running, but Create React App kind of hides that from you, which is both a good and a bad thing. So, for example, if we just go into like, we again have a, an app.js file. And just to give you a sense of this, like, for example, the import here uh, just sort of just works. Um, so the transpiling already sort of magically happens for you. And also like the JSX, like normally you can't just write like uh, a div tag in a JavaScript file and for that to just work. But Create React App sort of already has the scripts in place to make that magically work for you, which in most cases, is a good thing, but if you need like a little more control over this, uh, you you probably want to uh, sort of handcraft this yourself because at the moment it's kind of magical. Like I can't even show you the code that uh, makes all of this happen because Create React app essentially completely hides it from you altogether. Yeah. Now, one uh, question, um, Owen, oh, uh, looks like in the chat room, Joe is replying to something that DJ Concarn was asking about, like how to invoke a package script and uh, you can start uh, with NPX. Okay. Um, one, one question I have is if you uh, started on Stack Blitz and if you have that Webpack stuff, could you bring that thing down and then start working in your ID and then start reusing some of the CLI things that you have with Create React? You can, and I think StackBlitz even has like GitHub support, so you could even like have your code on GitHub and sort of move back and forth between them. I haven't tried it, so I don't know if it's a hundred percent foolproof, but at least in theory, I know that functionality is there and should work. <laughs> But I haven't tried it personally, so I can't give you like the 100% go for it sort of thing. 
But I mean, for me personally, I sort of use Stack Blitz when I need to sort of either just test something out real quick. Like if I'm just experimenting with something, I don't want to like create a whole new local project. I don't want to take the time to wait for everything. So that's one time I use Stack Blitz. The other time I'll use it is if I like need to share something with someone like why isn't this working? Let me try to recreate it in Stack Blitz so I can just give someone a URL like with the Kendra React team, for example, like for debugging yeah, purposes, yeah. it's it's amazing for that. But for like, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. But for actual real app development for that, I would do I do everything just completely locally. Right. And, and when you um, like have a quick prototype that you want to share, uh, and you have your dependencies like Stack Blitz is smart enough. Like when I pull up your project to just pull in the things that it needs to run. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So we have the basics in place. We have our imports. Um, we have our function, and then we are doing a render. Uh, what else? Uh, what else does somebody need to know to get started? So we should probably, the, I think the one other topic we, we need to make sure we get to is just JSX in general. So I, I guess, Sam, I, I'll, let, I'll rely on you here to kick things off. I guess, what do you know about JSX today? Look, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm old, OK? And I um, come from a day um, uh, early 2002-ish time frame when ASP.NET uh, in the .NET world wasn't yet a thing. And we used to do um, what was called uh, classic ASP. And uh, all of us uh, describe classic ASP as spaghetti code, because you are mixing and matching your, um, your markup and your code really close together. And um, all I know about JSX, I can read it, um, but <laughs> good old Sam. Uh, so it, it it's just a it's kind of a reverse of what we have done in any other JavaScript flavor, right? So you are embedding HTML directly inside of your JavaScript. Is that kind of the crux of JSX? Yep. Yeah, that's like the short version of it. Because you know, if I I'm in a .js file, JavaScript file, and like I have the ability, and actually we could just simplify this just to keep things really simple. Like normally in a .js file, if I tried to do this, then basically you're going to get a syntax error. And so what JSX allows you to do is basically under the hood, there's some React scripts working to like, what's actually going to ship to the browser is something that's going to take care of like actually use the browsers like DOM APIs and such. But it lets you during development time write essentially markup in your JavaScript or TypeScript files and takes care of the heavy lifting for you and also tries to do it in a performant way as well so that um, in theory, using these APIs is going to be faster than you sort of trying to manually mess with the DOM anyways. So you're, you're sort of putting your trust in React to take care of all of that for you. But that you've got the high level idea completely right. Okay, and then um, I think I may have asked you this, like just for, I know people don't do this, but could you separate out like your div tag, just the markup and put it in a separate file? Yeah, so let's say, all right, we, we talked about components a little bit earlier. And when we looked at it earlier, we were importing and exporting like a function for business logic. But one of the, the things that makes React so powerful is you can use that same sort of composition model to build up your markup. So let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say we our app needs a header, right? And I am going to export default. Let's say our header is something like, um, something like this. And actually I think I need the thing about React is I, I screw up the, the syntax all the time. So hopefully Chad is watching pretty closely because I'm going to to miss semicolons and stuff like this. Uh, so we have our header. And what I can do if I type things correctly is this, for example. Oh, and you need to import React for the magic to happen. And let me see, let's do some Visual Studio Code uh, magic here and put these things side by side. The 
idea of what's happening here is this is similar to what we looked at earlier, Sam, where we were exporting uh, earlier, we were exporting business logic essentially. And then we mm -hmm. were importing it into our, our main file that was driving the application. But in this case, I'm exporting uh, basically a, a chunk of markup, more or less, you can think of it as that, and then using that markup in here. And so the ability to put sort of markup in your JavaScript code or in like your business logic, it's a little bit wonky at first. And it honestly, it still is a little bit wonky even for me after I've been doing this for a while. But this is sort of the advantage that this can give you is you can build code that's a lot more composable um, and bring that sort of composability, like we generally consider composability to be a good thing uh, for software development. And because you're able to do that with markup, uh, it just gives you a lot more flexibility in how you work with UI code. Right. So at this point, like the header thing that you defined, that that even though you're bringing in just a markup, it is a component, right? It is a component, yeah. Yeah. It'll it'll this is actually yeah. React would actually call this a, a functional component because this is this syntax here is creating a, an anonymous function. So um this is a function, it's going to return this, and then JSX is gonna magically make this something that you know the browser can interpret and run, but it's a function that returns a component and then that component gets used in the JSX in the main app. Gotcha. Okay, uh, this is actually um, uh, similar, and, and and we know this. Like in the .NET world, we have Blazor, um, which is not trying to get rid of JavaScript, but it is for enterprises who don't want to write JavaScript. Um, it gives you a way of doing .NET front and back. And right now, um, Blazor is um, <clears throat> doing server side uh, and and doing a signal R uh, to maintain the DOM uh, between the server and the and the client side. But hopefully, uh, sometime by the middle of this year, you can see Blazor go full on uh, client side with WebAssembly. And the component model is actually very very similar to React. And and the way you defined header right there, the way you br brought in header is pretty much exactly how Blazor would do it. Interesting. We'll have to have add on yeah. to do one of these. 101. So yeah, teach us, teach us laser. Laser, yeah. So also one more question. Sorry, I'm, I'm really slow, as you can tell. I'm trying to get my no, head no, around. No, that's all, the whole point. All of this cool stuff. So if I am building a big React application, so what I'm, uh, what I'm seeing is I would define uh, multiple components, and each component will have its business logic. It'll have some markup that renders just something small on screen. And then um, we will have a larger, maybe a default app or something that brings in all the components together into one big page. Is that correct? Yeah, and as you might imagine, like as the complexity of the app rises, so could your your file tree, your component structure. Like you could have a folder that was header, and the header might have like an avatar component and. Uh, I don't know, a language change component and a settings component. Um, and then your main app, you could have like a body component and then a navigation component. And you could, I, I mean, then the next logical step would be to bring in something like a router. And then each router could have its own sort of um, different pages and different uh, things that some of which are reused, some of which aren't between those pages. And so this can get, I mean, there are some extremely large apps built with React. So um, the idea is that it does scale. Plenty of people are scaling to handle you know, huge applications with this. Um, but you like like any other programming ecosystem, like it becomes more important to be to establish some sort of s standards and such for how you're going to scale out because it, it's like the old like with great power comes great responsibility because you can create these really composable, really big structures. And then sometimes it can be a challenge to make sure others know what you're doing or that your your structure makes some sort of logical sense. Right, right. And so um, my next question would be, if you were um, kind of architecting your app right, you have all of these components, how do you talk to each other? Like if you had app.js pull up header, um, could you send something down to um, to header or set properties? Yeah, so let's do that. 
Uh, so let's say in the header, and I will just bring this up. I don't know why Visual Studio Code wants me to know about this. But let's say that I wanted my header to take in a name and uh, maybe also a color. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this header is like reusable. I reuse it across apps and I have different background colors I use. So I might do something like say I have a div and we'll put the, the header in a div and maybe the div has a style and I'll explain this in a second. Background color would be this color. And then I also wanted to show the name here. And so this is sort of the API that um, React is going to want. And I think I killed, oh, no, I just have an extra line. So let me, uh, so first of all, this is a JavaScript feature known as destructuring, uh, which is essentially a way of saying, let me pass this stuff in first. So let's say this thing is going to take a name and the color is going to be, I don't know, blue. And we'll see if this actually works. OK, so it did. And all right, let's see where I want to start building this. Actually, can I do, I'm playing around with uh, VS Code showing things here. All right, so let's start here. So this is essentially where I'm defining my API of what I want this component to take. So I'm saying I want to, I expect there to be a name and a color, essentially um, attribute or um, parameter that are, is going to come into this component. And this destructuring syntax is a way of like pulling it out of an object. So actually, let me let me see if I can show that first. Sorry, Sam, you can interrupt me if this goes off the rails too much. But let's say no, this is good. let's say I have var whatever, and it's an object that has like a and and uh, b in it. And let's see. So I have whatever it is an object, and what I could do is say x equals. I just wanted to pull like no, I want actually want. Oh, maybe this isn't the. Uh, essentially, I'm trying to figure out a good way of explaining this, but essentially it's saying this function expects an object, but I'm going to pull out just shorthand variable names to, to call these things easily so that I can say, um, and it's almost instead of having to say like parameters here and then having to come in here and say like params.color, it's a shorthand that lets me get um, essentially individual property names that I can use in my code. I don't know, does that make sense at all? Does this syntax? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah it does. And um, <clears throat> DJ Concurrent in the chat room was saying like the exact same thing, like how you describe the object A and then set it to whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. OK, so this makes a lot of sense. You are having the app um, uh, app level send things down. Could you go the other way? Like, could, you, could something happen in the header component that the app needs to respond to and how would you go backwards yeah once the uh dj hooked me up here this is what i was trying to show earlier and i i got saved uh, essentially this a i'm creating a variable but i'm destructuring a out of whatever so note how essentially i created a local variable from this object to get at this string property Hopefully that helps connect the dots of how uh, destructuring works. So thanks for that. Uh, I felt the need to finish that just because I had gotten started with it. Uh, and then the other thing, Sam, I should mention, and then I'll, I'll get to your question, is the JSX way of passing things is with this curly brace syntax. So you can't do like this, for example, uh, because React slash JSX has no way of knowing what this is. So this is essentially a way of saying, I'm going to pass some JavaScript code in here. So that can either be a variable name or it could be like, say, a property, for example, to make that work. And then was your was your question about events then? Um, yeah, I guess you could do it with events like you, we clearly see how you pass parameters down. But what if something happens in the header and you want to pass it up? Gotcha. 
Um, so let's see what we can do here. Let's say we need to do something when this H1 gets, uh, let's say clicked, for example. So the easiest way to start doing this would be something like, and actually let me do my, uh, we'll see if I can live code some React. So I changed the syntax up there to just be a little more longhand to give us a little more space to work. So when I use the parentheses syntax, that's a way of saying like instantly return this value. And I changed it to instead say, now I've got a full function and I want to do some stuff before I return. So one the, the sort of easiest way to start doing this is let's say um, if we're not involving, uh, let's say a click handler. If we're not involving multiple components, uh, just to show the React syntax for this. So if I wanted to, do something whenever somebody clicks the, oh. React is actually pretty good about giving you error messages when you do something silly too. So for example, I could do things like uh, what I just did there. So I'm saying on click, which is like a built-in React way. And there's one of these handlers for basically every browser event that there is. And what I'm saying is on click, uh, you run this click handler. So run this function, it does an alert, and we do a click. Uh, for React function, I'm just reading what DJ is in the chat here. For React functional components, the first argument to define is the props arg. That is what's being destructured here. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then another question that came in that says, hey, what ID are you using for now? So this is Visual Studio Code. And actually, one of the things I like about VS Code is it's quite good about giving you ways of sort of orienting different files next to each other, um, which is what I'm doing here. And I also like the, the built-in terminal support as well. So I'm a pretty big fan of VS Code, uh, but really you can write React in just about anything, but I think VS Code is particularly good at it. Yeah, I was, um, uh, I think a lot of us, we were there at a uh, Microsoft Build Conference, I think four years back when they first launched VS Code. And it was a surprise, uh, but I mean, who knew that uh, this would be the thing that every JavaScript developer uses? Yeah, no, like who would have thought that Microsoft would have been a cool <laughs> company for JavaScript developers to? <laughs> crazy and, and so, and so uh, while you're quoting this uh, one other question you can come back to this I had was like I, I see the CLI tools but uh, in terms of what VS Code does for you um, I mean you're writing JavaScript so, so the JavaScript intelligence is built in but is there any react specific tools that you have installed um, it's I don't think I have any extensions maybe I do let's find out uh, doesn't look like that I do I know that there's some built-in stuff for handling, like, um, for example, note how uh, the JSX sort of just works. And I, there's also like JSX formatting built in too that I use all the time. So like if I mangle this, right, if I do some complete nonsense, I can hit, uh, let's see, Option Shift F, which is sort of the built-in VS Code formatter. And it works extremely well with React and JSX code. So sometimes if I just paste code in from the internet, it's a great way of uh, figuring all this out. We got another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, what the name represents of these JS codes? I don't think I, um, do you understand the question? Well, yes, I, I'm trying to. So uh, M. Hanthi, I mean, you, you don't want to get any more newbie than me when it comes to <laughs> React. I'm just trying to learn here from TJ. And I think he or she may be referring to the constant name, TJ, that you have up there and what you're passing down into the header. Oh, yeah. So basically what I'm, the, the complete flow here is I'm creating this constant. Uh, it could be, I mean, could be a var, it could be a let, it, it won't actually change the functionality of this. And so this is just a local JavaScript variable at this point. And the complete flow is, and through JSX, you have the ability to pass JavaScript, um, essentially variables or really JavaScript anything using this, uh, this uh, curly brace syntax. So this is passing this local variable through the name attribute which is gonna make it down into this variable in my header here. 
and ultimately is going to get rendered in this h1 using that exact same curly brace syntax which is going to output that so that's sort of the complete flow the name goes from here uh, down into the next component through here which puts it in this variable and then it's ultimately going to get rendered in this h1 so sam i, I can show the the event here i will uh, note that like how to handle events when you have uh, like uh, whole component trees is actually uh, like a hotly debated react topic because there's there's different ways you can do it like where should the events be handled because it can get pretty messy if you think about like uh, let's say you had your header had a settings widget and that setting widget did something there's some discussion of like well how do you handle that if like your header needs to know if the settings were clicked because it needs to make something else happen mm -hmm. and it's sort of a hotly contested issue is uh, it like bubbled all the way up to anybody who'd want to listen the idea is usually you want to implement your logic in the the sort of highest level component where it makes sense to handle it um, and usually that's also the other thing that i i don't know if we'll have time to handle this today but if we get into the topic of state and oh yeah i know that's that's that's, hard to do that's a, as well. a different can't, a whole different can of worms because the same sort of thing happens there. Uh, but typically I'd want to say like in here, like I could say on click and I want my click handler to run. And then you'd essentially take this in through a prop. So I'd say on click in here, I'd want to run my on click handler and I'll save this and save this. And essentially that just moves that logic around. So now I'm saying, I'm not gonna handle clicks in this header directly, but I'm gonna expose an API so that if the component that uses this needs to know about clicks, it now has a way of tying into this handler so that it can make it happen. What would happen if you had multiple on-click handlers? Uh, you wouldn't, you, you just pick one and then like essentially you would if you need to do multiple things, you'd handle all of that in here. Uh, like, but if you're saying like, if you had multiple things that use the header, for example. Well, I mean, by mistake, if you, let's just say you forgot and you define the click handler once in the header and once in the app, like, is there a precedence of who wins? Um, well, like browser events, multiple things can subscribe to it technically. Um, and the order, like this gets into like some uh, old school jQuery where like you could have uh, a click event, for example, on multiple different things. And the, the way the clicks will work would be they would like bubble up. So like your button would get the click, then the header would get the click, then like the app would get the click sort of deal. But just in general, you, you want to avoid doing that because that like no one really knows. Like if you get in that situation, it's, it's, it, it would almost be considered like mm -hmm. a race condition and like, you just you don't want to just you don't want to be in that scenario where people are guessing like what is going to run here um uh, typically you want to keep things simple and just do single event handlers and if you need to do something complex here you'd handle that complexity in here yeah so uh dj in the chat room uh is saying that probably the one that wins or is acted upon first is the one that's defined in the h1 like in the doms uh on click itself yeah i think that's right because it would do that and then it would bubble up um yeah. so I, I, dj i'm pretty sure you're right but again i would say try to avoid that situation if possible unless it's absolutely necessary yeah so tj i think uh i mean you can go on and on teaching me about all things react we may want to be um conscious of people's time we said we'll go an hour uh, and then we can definitely resume from exactly where we leave uh today but just if I'm starting up, is there anything else I should know about React? I don't think so. I think if you're starting, so just to sort of um, summarize, I guess at this point would probably be a decent idea. If you just end up on the, the React documentation, uh, for example, and you just click this Get Started button, the thing I'd encourage you to do is to start on one of these online learning environments because it's going to be the, the very simplest to do. And you might have a favorite. I personally am a fan of Stack Blitz. So I, if you just go to the Stack Blitz homepage, even there's a big button that says just start building with React and you can get started. 
So that's what I'd recommend most new people do. And when you are ready to get serious and you want to get beyond just sort of experimenting and testing the basics, check out Create React App. It's a repo on GitHub. Uh, it, again, a Google search will get you here pretty easily. I mean, it's got 77,000 stars on GitHub. So this is a pretty popular uh, tool that you can use. Uh, test this out locally, uh, sort of experiment. And yeah, I, I guess uh, it's it's a pretty cool tool if you've, if you've not tried React before, even if you have no interest in it, it's just sort of, it's, it's fun to experiment with because it's really has some unique takes on really just in general, how you approach app dev. Absolutely. Um, UV, UWO in the chat room uh, was asking what the DOM meant. It's, it's the document object model. It's essentially the visual tree um, that your HTML is building up in browser to display the app's content. And then so far, um, TJ, you talked about just some of the basic um, browser-based uh, DOM, but I mean, there's a lot of UI to this, right? I, I know you uh, are heavily involved in building up uh, Kendo React. And so what what is our UI? What is that UI different from uh, the regular UI? Yeah, so a lot of React development is component-based. So this header that we're building is a component. But as you might imagine, these components can get quite complex. So uh, think once you start building real-world apps and you need a date picker and a calendar and a grid and a scheduler and all these other things. So where we come into the equation and progress and the reason we care about this stuff is we build professional components to help people out when they start to build these apps at scale. So we have a tool set that offers 70 plus components that are built in. You can see some of them in action. Like we have the grid here, uh, some other controls. And if you had to actually just kind of react.com, you can sort of experiment around, check out some of the components that we offer. But the high level pitch is essentially pre-made components that are native React components. Uh, so they're gonna work with the exact same syntax that React developers would expect, uh, but help you solve some of those, the, some of the harder problems you have to solve in real world app dev, especially if you're building like a uh, line of business apps, you need things like charts and graphs and grids and such. Okay, and uh, maybe just one last question, TJ, before we call it a wrap for today. Uh, let's just say I've built up to what you just did. I'm happy with my app.js. I'm happy with my header, and I want to publish this. So how do you build and package this up to be put on a web server? Yeah, so there are built-in ways. So let me get the exact name. Essentially, if you run, a, there's a build step built into um, the, the create react setup that'll do a build. Uh, it'll get like the production versions of your files and it'll put in like either, I think it's called a build folder. It might be a disk folder, but just a series of files that you can upload to any web hosting that you like. So you can throw it on GitHub pages. You could throw it on Netlify. You could throw it on Firebase. You could throw it on Azure, you know, pick your favorite web hosting option of choice. And some of them, like, I know, um, if any of you were for, here for our quarantine coding stream we did a while earlier. Netlify is one I particularly like because they have um, ways of tying into GitHub. And really all, I, all you have to do with Netlify is push your, your React project to GitHub and point Netlify at GitHub and it takes care of the rest. Uh, but I know Azure does the same sort of thing. Lots of other services do it as well. So it really is quite easy nowadays. And I, I think some of that is because React is so popular that if you're doing web hosting, like you have some page that talks about how to work with React apps because it's one of the most, if not the most popular option out there. Gotcha. And uh, DJ in the chat room was saying state is the next step. So I'm sure that's a lot to open up. Yeah, if, if you did enjoy this, you know, let us know because this is something we're looking to do more of some of this uh, learning type material on Twitch. So if you wanna see React part two, uh, now with more state, let us know or, or other yeah. topics, just feel free to, to chime in with the chat. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, you know, I mean, we, we tend to talk about the advanced stuff a lot, but the reality is there's just too much going on. Like it's impossible for like even a .NET developer to know everything else that's going on. And I hear about all the cool JavaScript things and I can tinker around, but it, it helps to have somebody like you kind of explain the steps because we don't know all of the moving pieces. Oh yeah, and it's the same vice versa. So that's, I'm looking forward to being on the other side of the screen when we talk about Xamarin, so. <laughs> yes, I'll try to see. I, I don't know if I 
I have as good a grasp of the basics as you do, um, but we'll try. We'll make it work. We can fumble yeah. around together. That's that's fun too. Yes. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. If, if you enjoyed this at all, um, you know, we appreciate subscribers to the Coded Live channel. You can get content like this. Uh, we have uh, a list that's going to be on tonight with uh, Carl from our uh, actually Kendi UI team as well. Oh, well, that's right. Uh, so that's on later. Today. NGConf is happening today, right? Or yeah, I think NGConf is happening like right now, maybe actually. Okay. So what Carl and Alyssa are doing are watching each session so that you don't have to, and they're going to do a TLDR session. Nice. Uh, I think it's like. Um, seven hours from now something like that so um we should have it um it should be on the calendar if you just scroll down in the coded live channel it should be there so yeah. definitely check that out as well it's awesome and uh teacher you're out uh, the rest of the week so um we'll, we'll do the learning xamarin thing next week but um i'll be on here tomorrow um, yeah, that's right uh, yeah I'll, I'll try to build out maybe uh, speaking of azure i'll try to build out an azure backend as a service because Again, we, we talk about all these web apps and mobile apps, but the basics of it is you, you need some hosting, you need some services that you can ping, and you need some data that you want to consume in your app. So uh, I would love to build that out uh, with the help of the chat room. So that's what I'll do tomorrow. And then next week, DJ, maybe you can start off from exactly where we left off here and talk about state uh, for React, and then we'll start with Xamarin. Sounds good. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you happen to be, but see you. Yeah, thank you.